for Curry County Voices. I appreciate their uh, providing us a recorded message for those who would like to view at a later time. I would like to uh, always do this, remind you of upcoming events. Next Tuesday, Tara Devi will be here talking about yoga and how to add balance to your life through good health or health practices. Uh, on the 21st, Cameron Rohar, Rohorst will be here to talk about beach booty. He's from the, his wife is at the state park. She's a state park director, I think, here at Harris Beach. And he's, gonna, he's been with the state park service, and he's going to talk about rocks and some of the other fun things you can find along the beach. And then Artie Kelly will be here to, on the 28th to talk about Medicare 101. And then we have one other on our lecture series this month will be on understanding complementary medicine. Uh, people have asked about uh, CBDs and acupuncture and other things like that. We'll start out uh, this Thursday with uh, kind of an overview and then move into some of the other people that uh, practice in this area, apothecary and so forth, that will talk about their craft and give us some insights on different alternatives to medicine. Um, with that, I want to turn our time over to uh, Chris Everhart, our interim superintendent for the Brookings Harbor School District. And he has, uh, we met a month or so, well, almost two months ago, and we were talking about the youth in the area, and we struck up a conversation about how perceptions uh, affect the performance and the opportunities for youth. So he readily agreed to give us a presentation, and we're thrilled that he's agreed to be here, and we'll turn the time over to Chris at this point. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So good evening. As he said, I'm currently the superintendent of schools here in Brookings Harbor, and a little background before I start, this is my 32nd year going to school as an educator, a long time before that as a student. And each year that I work in education, I, I think the, the message I'll share with you becomes more and more powerful as far as understanding. At the end of the day, all I do as a leader, all I do as a, as a community member is shape perceptions which ultimately influence behavior. So my message today kind of refers back to the, the saying I have up here that says it's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. And what I want to think about is us to think about is the intentionality of our transactions with other people and how we ultimately shape how young people view education, how we view each other, how we view community, how we view possibility and opportunity. Those things oftentimes happen by chance, but what we're seeing today more and more in our culture is it is happening with an intentionality because people who have means, excuse me, have the means to somehow manipulate perceptions with more intentionality and they have the finances to do it, I assure you they do not have the students of Brookings Harbor School District in their best interests. They have their own financial interests in mind before they have those of our children. And the same applies to you. And hopefully after I'm done today you'll understand what I mean by that. So I'm going to start by telling you a little bit of a story, and I, I do my presentation with a lot of visual and a lot of stories, but this was given to me by my mother when I taught psychology many, many years ago. My mother was a little bit paranoid when I started teaching psychology because we had a family of six kids and we were normally dysfunctional. Our house was crazy, nothing was perfect, there was a lot of screaming, a lot of yelling, a lot of picking on each other, so she was afraid when I taught psychology which is study of human behavior and understanding how we become who we are. But she was always cutting things out of the newspaper. My mother was a German immigrant. She was, after World War II, she was a refugee. She met my father in the service. She came to the United States basically knowing very little English. And one way she learned how to read was to look at the newspaper, because newspapers are written at the sixth grade level, and obviously one very good place to put words to pictures is on that page. So she would send me clippings of articles, and she sent me this probably 25 years ago. And I like it because it reminds me of the power I have as an educator. Because sometimes you feel powerless. We feel like we don't have any kind of control over the world. But the family circus here, the little sister, the older sister to the younger brother, says to him, yesterday's the past, tomorrow's the future, but today is the gift. That's why it's called the present. <laughs> and when I am down, and sometimes you run into some obstacles, being a leader of, the, of a school as a principal or as a superintendent now, or even as a parent or as a brother or a sister or a husband or a wife or a community member, 
you sometimes think, I'm really frustrated. But I want students and I want my staff to feel like regardless of what has happened to you last period yesterday, you have the gift of the next transaction. You have the power to impact a relationship. We were talking about how we might use this, and my hunch is you will use this probably tonight in a conversation you have with someone you care for. Maybe you'll go to the, the Sonic and you'll try and get a soda pop, and some student, one of our students behind the counter is going to mess up. We don't have Sonic. We don't? <laughs> no. How about uh, it's Dutch It's miles, hours. It's hours. So where would be a place we might find one of our students? McDonald's, right? And they might make a mistake. And as a leader and as a teacher, we are always having transactions with students that shape how they view themselves. And how you view yourself ultimately impacts how you feel about yourself and then how you behave and act towards yourself and other people. And if we want to change the way we treat one another, or we want to change the way students view education, we better understand how you learn to view education and how you learn to view yourself. And if we don't do it with an intentionality, with the gift of the present, of the next transaction, if we don't do that with intentionality as adults, I assure you, Facebook, Snapchat, Coca-Cola, Chevy, Dodge, every company that wants to manipulate young, young people's perceptions of things, they're going to fill that void. And it works. If you think that advertising does not do ultimately what Psychology 101 does, which is shape behavior, the understanding of behavior, if we don't seize those moments, like my mom said, the gift of the next transaction, someone else will. My mother, this means a lot to me because she died in 2001 of acute myeloid leukemia. She had a tough life, nothing was easy, but she was incredibly optimistic. And that's what the little brother is learning here. You have a gift, what are you gonna do with it? So what are you gonna do with the next transaction you have with the person we struggle with, with a partner we don't understand, with a frustrated student in our classroom, with a kid that we haven't talked to in three or four years. That is the commonality of us. I saw a beautiful movie the other day, maybe you saw it, and I'm going to use this phrase a lot, the Fred Rogers movie about the neighborhood. There was a comment in there. He said, a comment in the movie that I think was mentioned two or three times. He said, if it's mentionable, it's manageable. We are afraid to talk about things sometimes in our lives because they attach a lot of pain and hurt and shame. And we have to start talking about difficult times, difficult challenges, if we want to heal. If you have not seen the movie, I encourage you to do so. It is so simple and so powerful. And hopefully that will, is what my message will be for you today. I also want you to realize you and I don't see everything. You miss things. I miss them all to that all the time. And I have to operate as a leader of an educational community, understanding that I'm going to mess up. So here's an example of maybe how you will mess up. I want you to stay focused. I want you to keep your eye on the ball. And I want you to not be misled. So I'm going to show you here a little video clip. And what I want you to do is I want you to count the number of times the people wearing white shirts toss a basketball to someone else in a white shirt. If you've seen this, please just enjoy. If you have not seen this, experience this for the first time. I'm going to tell you to watch a particular thing, and I'd like you to do this in count. Take a look. Count how many times the players wear white past the basketball. How many passes did you count? Fifteen. Six. What's with the gorilla? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I got it. But did you see the gorilla? No. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
It was there. That's called selective attention, and that is called us having the courage as adults to admit that we don't see things all the time. And we are not perfect. And we miss things. And how many conflicts have I had with a student, a teacher, a parent, a kiddo, simply because we're looking at the exact same thing in a different way? I'm sad to hear that we had missile strikes against United States targets today. But I assure you, the reason those behaviors are happening because of people in that community called Iraq simply view events in a different way than we do. And that is a great example of how perceptions influence behavior. And if we don't have the courage and the time and take the thoughtfulness to really examine how we learn to view the world, we will destroy ourselves in ways that sometimes people don't talk to each other for 15, 20 years because they had a disagreement about an old car or a will. And you folks know that because you're adults, it's happened in my family, and you're no different than my family, except your battles, your views of the same thing happen in a different way. And it takes courage. And I hear people complain all the time in education about kids. And I assure you, we are never going to change education unless we focus on the adults in our communities and the ones that are raising the kids. And that is scary. And that's part of my role, is to help us be aware of a gift of the present. Which, I tell you what, we don't always want to be aware of that. Because everybody, at the end of the day, has a story. And I can be more effective as a leader if I understand that this gentleman has a story. What's your name? Sorry. Randy. Randy. Randy has a story. I think I've met you, Randy, haven't I? No, I don't think so. Diane. Randy and Diane, they have a story. They have a life that is every experience they've had, whether they realize it or not, somehow most of those are stored in their brain. And your brain keeps track of almost everything. It is an incredible supercomputer giga machine that tracks everything. And it becomes your life, it becomes your experience. And just as we were talking before, it impacts how we recall memories. It re impacts how we recall events. It impacts how we see the next event. This is a picture of a, of a family in Broken Bro or in Custer County, Nebraska. I'm from Nebraska, and right away you probably had all kinds of thoughts about, oh, Nebraska, he is what kind of a fan? Cornhusker fan, right? <laughs> Duh! It automatically pops in your head. Automatically. When I moved to Colorado and then to Oregon, as soon as people here from Nebraska, they say, oh, you're a Husker fan. They made a pre-assumption about me. Right or wrong or different. doesn't mean it's right or wrong or good or bad. It's just what we do because we have a brain. The brain keeps track of our story, and our story impacts our next day. Wouldn't it be interesting to sit down with this family and understand their life? And how better could we be, or how, more, how much more effective could we be as adults if we took time to understand the story of the different people we encounter in our life? If we really, really wanted to solve problems, if we really wanted to advance certain things. But it takes time, it takes courage, and it takes us willing to admit, I didn't see the gorilla. And it's okay, because you're human. And we miss stuff all the time. I miss stuff all the time. When I was a little boy, my brother Mike and I, and Mike is the gentleman there on the right, he was, he's one year and two weeks older than I am. We were like called twins. We spent a whole bunch of time together. My mother and father had six children. I'm the fifth child in a family of six. I have three older brothers. I thought my name was Wuss for the first 15 years of my life with three older brothers. Right? Anybody have an older brother and you can understand that part of my story? You used to sit on me. Gave me claustrophobia by putting a pillow on my face. Anybody have that? Or is that just me? Get dumped all the time, held at the bottom of the pool, had tremendous fear of small places. Why? Because the experiences I had in my story impacted how I looked at events in my life. Right, wrong, or different, it's who I am. That's me in kindergarten. Didn't smile. Mike, kindergarten or first grade, smiled. Why didn't I smile? When I was a little kid, about two years old, I fell off my trike, knocked both my front teeth out. 
What do you think everybody thought I wanted for Christmas for three years of my life? <laughs> so what did I do to avoid that conversation? Didn't smile. So the way people talked to me shaped my story, which eventually, a simple thing, an example of how it shaped my behavior. Not right, not wrong, not good, not bad, just the way it was. And if we want to understand people and have more productive relationships and productive communities, we need to understand little things like that impact people. We did all kinds of things together. We had some horses. This is me on the Shetland Pony Jimmy, Mike on our horse Peppy. We broke this horse. We were inseparable as young boys. We did all kinds of mischievous things, and we did some really cool things. One thing we did at, one, at some point in time in our life is we made a car because we were inspired by the movie Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Anybody see Chitty Chitty Bang Bang? I was so motivated. We, my mom and dad, they were so happy when we were outside of the house because we're not in the house fighting and kicking and screaming. But about 40 years ago, probably more than 40, probably 40, I was probably 10, 11 years old, over 40 years ago, we made this car, Mike and I did. Put a little airplane motor on the front, a little airplane motor on the back. The propeller is broken here, so that's why you can't see if there's a propeller. And we put fuel in the reservoir, we put electrical sh uh, charge on that, we'd spin the motor, uh, the propeller backwards, we'd start that engine up, we'd start this one, one up, we'd put it on the floor, and that part the concrete, and that car would go. How do you think I felt about that car? That's pretty cool. I've had it over 40 years. You think I'd sell it to you today for $1,000? <laughs> no, because well, it's part of what? Out themselves are worth 1000 piece. Is it? I'm not going to sell it to you. <laughs> it's part of my story, right? And it's part of my relationship with my brother Mike. Mike and I. Years of things. This is more than a car. And who has a story in her life? So does he have a car? No. Yeah. <laughs> he's, got he's got other stuff. He okay. might have stitches for me. I don't even know. <laughs> we didn't fight myself. But see, stories change. And if we want to be effective as adults in our community, and if we want to be effective as whatever role we play in other people's lives, we have to understand that stories change. That's a picture of my son Carter and my sister Dara. I have a younger sister. She's four years younger than me. This is on June 23rd. 2009. Carter is 17 and a half years old. He's in between his junior and senior year in high school. <clears throat> Earlier that year, when he was a junior in high school, when he went to the doctor to have a routine, uh, he's got a routine little nose thing done. He had a blood test and he found out he was in stage four kidney failure in his junior year in high school. Living a normal life, all of a sudden finds out, wow, this is a pretty traumatic thing. So things change. My story changed. His story changed. This is June 24th, 2009. On this day, from here to here, my sister Darla gave my son Carter her left kidney. And then on December 17th, 2016, that's Darla and Carter. That's Darla Carter, my sister's husband, John, their daughter, Harper, and this is Carter and his wife, Jane. I share that with you because life happens, and we forget that sometimes. And he now has a transplanted kidney, and he will need multiple kidney transplants in his life. There is no cure for his disease. I don't know how long the kidney will last. The average kidney lasts 15 to 20 years. He's had this one for 10 years now. But he's on medications, immunosuppressive medications, which, you know, all this stuff. You know, you know the medication thing. Maybe some of you know someone. You know one thing affects the other, and he has all these things, and so he'll need another trans kidney transplant at some point in time. But medication is expensive, right? So let's say that somehow he loses his job. He gets down on his time. I lose my job. I run out of money. He runs out of money. And I need $1,000 to buy a medication so he can continue to live. Am I going to sell you my car for $1,000 to get my son medication so he can live? You're not right. I don't know how many times I've heard in my career where people come in to me and say, Chris, why did that kid do what they did? I don't know, but there's probably a reason. There's probably a reason. It happens all the time. 
And we oftentimes don't have the time to understand the story to really be effective in our relationships because for goodness sakes, we get busy. We got stuff to do, right? We got places to be. So one of the greatest gifts we can give to each other is the time to understand the story because the story is what shapes our perception. And perceptions are essentially what shape our behavior. And once again, if we don't fill that void with intentionality, I assure you someone else will. Perception, the definition, is essentially attaching meaning to what we sense. And you have five senses, which we'll talk about in a minute. But I have a, <clears throat> these, these yellow things are words. And I'm going to have a picture come up to you uh, here in just a second. And immediately, when you see that picture, a word is going to pop in your head. And that's what perception is. It is when information goes through your senses, goes to your brain, and you attach meaning to it, you have an understanding of what it is. Each one of these is a different language for saying, what is that? Brain. My brain. Now, why do you say brain? Because you grew up where we learned to say brain and attach it to that. If you were in that country, I don't know what you'd call it. Does anybody know what you'd call it? I don't know. This is Italian, this is Russian, this is Arabic, that's Spanish, I think. I don't even know for sure. Because I haven't grown up to experience that as my normal. Normal. What's normal? Does it depend on what country you're from? Does it depend on what room you live in your house? Does it depend on what side of the tracks you live on? Does it depend on the language you have? Does normal, depend, does normal depend on how much money you have or didn't have growing up? Mm -hmm. All of those things. It's complicated, right? It's complicated. So all of these things that we gain and we program our brain with come to us through our senses. And an example of perception right here. In our language, the English language, when this happens, we've agreed to say what to that child. What word do we say when they have that experience? Sour. Sour. Right? Sour. You attach meaning to what you sense. You have this thing, you don't know what it is, but you're going to figure it out, and you're going to look around, and you're going to try and experience that and understand it. And we have a thing on our head called the brain, in our head called our brain, which is a supercomputer on steroids. Mm -hmm. And here's another thing, perception. As soon as you saw that, for some of you, immediately you understood what kind of doll it was. Yeah. Yep. Kind of is it? How do you know? <clears throat> My girls have. <laughs> That's perception. Attaching meaning to what you sense, what you taste, what you smell, what you hear. Driving down the road. You run across this certain smell, you think it's a skunk, or they're growing weed, right? <laughs> now you understand what it smells like when you have weed around. That's a new experience, right? Don't know. Kind of, kind of the same smell, though. But that's perception, attaching meaning to what you see, taste, touch, smell, and feel. This is a Cabbage Patch doll. Use Jeff Roy. By the way, his name is Jeff Roy. What? Why? You know what Cabbage Patch dolls had, right? What they have? They have. And name that comes with them. They're adopted. Birth certificate, right? This is Jeff Roy, 1983-84. Wow. Been around a long time. Has a name though. Brian, that's your name, right? Yeah. Yeah. You want to go Jeff Roy? Yeah. What was your name? Randy. Randy, okay. I've just changed your name. Okay. <laughs> I hope you agree to that. Hey, Brian, yeah. So at some point in time, Jeff Roy is hanging out with Randy, and Randy's his uncle, can I call him Uncle Randy? Mm -hmm. And, and Jeff Roy is a curious kid. Let's hold him up a little bit. And Jeff Roy is trying to understand his world. And Uncle Randy, Randy, right? Right. <laughs> is going to talk to him once in a while. But Jeff Roy is going to touch this. Now, why is Jeff Roy going to touch this? Curious. Yeah, you don't, you don't have to tell him to touch it, right? He just does it because he's got a brain. And every child does this where? All over the planet. Mm -hmm. Everywhere. He's going to touch it. Is he going to put it in his mouth? Every kid on the planet puts it in their mouth. How many of you have a child or grandchild that ate dog food? And what did you do when they ate the dog food? You said, it. You taught that child to associate a negative experience with that thing. 
Why? Because you wanted to shape their behavior with intentionality. He's going to touch us, he's going to kick it, he might even throw it on the floor. Did you ever have a child who threw the Cheerios off the chair, off the high chair, and they looked over it, and what did you do? You picked it up and you put it back on there. <laughs> And they did it again and again, right? The game of learning behavior. At some point in time, Jeff Way's going to look at this, he's going to touch it, he's going to taste it, and then he's going to look at Uncle Randy. And what's he want to do? Name it. And he's going to say it's a... Hmm? What is this? What is it? Football. It's a football. Yeah. Is he going to say it's a football? Probably not. He's no. probably going to start with ball. And he's going to say, ball. And Jeff Roy is going to hear that. How many times is he going to hear that? Hundreds of times. He's going to say, ball, 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 ball. And then he's going to touch it. He's going to look at it. He's going to look at Uncle and say, ball. And you're going to do what? <laughs> Yay! <laughs> what color is this? Green. Who said? <laughs> who Boy, said it's green? Good. Who said green is green and who said this is a ball? I share that with you because there's exactly the moment we need to understand. If we don't step in there and teach a young person how to look at their face, how to look at their feet, their shoes, their skin, a pimple, an imperfection, someone else will. What does Clarisville want every teenage kid to do when they look in the mirror when they're a teenager? What does Clarisville want them to focus on? their pimple. And what do they want them to think of that pimple? It's bad. You're a It's bad. By Clarisil, you're gross. And does it work? Absolutely. Because we could tell Jeff Roy that this is a chair. And if we want to have a conspiracy against Jeff Roy, we all tell him it's a chair. And we tell him it's purple, not green, and everybody, grandma, grandpa, brother, sister, aunt, uncle, everybody tells him it's a purple chair. What's he going to think it is? A purple chair. What's this? Okay. I'm going to put another word in your mouth. Now, what is it? A puppet. I just simply did that, and you knew what it was. That's perception. And we do it so naturally over time. But right now, how many little kids are sitting at home in front of a TV, no adult around, and they're being bombarded with thousands of images that are designed to do exactly what I took 10 minutes to explain. And they do it again and 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 again for years until we can almost be guaranteed that if you have a pimple, you're going to feel insecure. And it works. And what I'm asking us to do, and I'm asking our teachers to consider, our counselors to consider, is the gift we have called the present, that very next transaction, to shape a different view that somehow allows you to think, I'm okay if I got a pimple. Because who gets pimples? Everybody. Everybody. Nobody's perfect. Nobody has it made. We're all trying to limp our way through life and find meaning and purpose. And I want students to come to our schools tomorrow morning and think, I'm okay. I'm not perfect, but I'm okay. I want to learn. I can't spell very good. Will you help me? What signal could I send to a frustrated third grader trying to do spelling and I stand by the desk and I say, we're waiting. Mm -hmm. Everybody else is done. How does that transaction shape how a child views the capacity or desire to learn? I made in my career and in my life as a parent, I've made hundreds of mistakes. But what is the most important moment is the next transaction. It's the gift. But it's scary because we don't even know we're missing the gorilla sometimes. So we learn to perceive literally 
millions of things. And what do we do with these things is the dance we call of education. And we're all educators. You cannot not educate. If you have an interaction with somebody, another human being, you are teaching them something. Because we don't know what a child knows about an ice cream cone, or a dart, or a fire hydrant. These are all blank until we tell a child, a person, how to view that thing. And that's through our transactions with them. Once again, if we don't do it with intentionality, will someone fill that void? And will their purpose be the same as ours? Not only do we learn how to perceive things, we learn how to perceive others. And when I say others, there are lots and lots of people on the planet Earth. And nobody looks quite the same, depending on your geography of where you live, depending on uh, the climate you live in. We dress differently, we look differently, we have a different culture. And what are we teaching our young people about others who are different? What are we teaching each other about people who are different? Some of you might know me, some of you might not know me. Some of you maybe have heard something about me. And you, what could be favorable, say, oh, I'm going to go watch that Eberhard guy. I heard he's a nice guy. So you look for things that would reinforce what you believe. Oh, I hear he's a real whatever. He's got this weird tick where he jumps up and kicks the leg out like that. So you come in, you sit down, and they do that kick once, and what do you think? I knew he was going to do that kick. <laughs> we can do the same thing with you. We can say, oh, watch out for that person. We can do the same thing with math, science, English, social studies, purple, dogs, cars. Young children do not know how to perceive the world until we teach them. They do not know who they dislike until we teach them. Now, if a child can learn from experience that's uncontrolled, a dog bites a kid, dog's afraid of that. The kid is afraid of that particular dog. But things that are neutral, which in most instances are other people, we frame how children see other people. Because they don't know. Jeff Roy does not know when he wakes up in the morning how to judge that person. I can remember distinctly when my boys were walking into Skagway, which is like a Fred Myers, but in Grand Island, Nebraska. Carter is two years older than Connor, and they're walking in there, and Carter's about four or five, Connor's about two, and they were just curious little guys. And they walk into the store, and they look over there at the counter, and there's a gal standing behind the counter in her little blue Skagway coat, and she was missing her arm. So Carter's walking along and he stops and looks. Why do you look? Why do you stare? Is he a bad kid? He's curious. Didn't know what it was. Now I could have said, Carter, get over here. Don't look. Don't stare. Don't you stare. Get over here. Fortunately, that didn't happen. The gal behind the counter, her name is Mrs. Novak. I had her son in my psychology class. She noticed my curious little boys over there. And she said, come here. So they both scurry over there. She pulls up her sleeve. Let's untouch her arm and explains her arm to them. Nice. It's a big deal, isn't it? Yeah. It's a gift. It was a transaction that impacts how my children would see other people that are different. And whether we realize it or not, hate is an adult curriculum. We gotta own that. Little kids do not know who to hate. They don't know who to be afraid of until we tell them to. Does that impact how we treat other people? Absolutely. So we learn how to view things. We then learn how to view others. And probably the most powerful thing we ever learn how to view is ourselves. Mm -hmm. How I view me. I look at when I look in the mirror. I know what Clearsill wants me to look at. <laughs> and given a void on how we should view each other, people will step in and they'll do it for us. And they will not have the same intentions as our educators and parents, I hope we do. Do any of you have a grandchild? 
You are brilliant to them. Whether you realize it or not. And what we do with those moments is we program. In the 1950s, a thing in television started to show up. And then it just got more advanced and more advanced. And I assure you right now, once again, there's millions of kids that are sitting at home with no adults around to filter what they're hearing and watching and seeing. And the goal of those folks on the other end of this device is to do what I just pointed out they're trying to do. They're trying to shape that child's behavior through giving them images and words and thoughts and feelings about those things. And then when it's left uninterrupted, we, in education, I assure you, we are going to lose. We cannot compete with this. I give. And it's scary. What's scary is because a no 16-year-old kid can buy and have a contract for a phone. It's against the law. You have to be 18 years old or older to sign a contract to have a cell phone plan. No kid can sign up for a, a, a cable company. No child can do that. That's adults. And we are letting, across many, many homes, unfettered access to the young minds of kiddos every single day. And it's scary. But there are things we can do because we have the gift called the present. Why does this make a difference? Because perceptions influence behavior and it gets downright personal. To give an example, there is a company out there, a couple companies that have a conspiracy against me, a 54-year-old white male who has an issue that I don't think is an issue, but they want me to think it's an issue because they want me to... Uh. What does Rogaine want me to think? You're ugly. Because You're balding. I am balding. I don't know how I got this email, but this is an email. Literally, I received it on October 3rd, 2012 to my school email from Bosley, which is a hair transplant thing. They literally, they literally pluck a hair that's root out from down here and they pop it in your head. That's what they do. Listen to what this says. It's tough to see the man in your life worry about losing his hair. You love him just the way he is, but there's no denying that as his hair changes, his confidence seems to, too. Bullcrap. Let me have my hair. My hair is neutral until acted upon by an outside source. And they want to act on that, and they want to make, make me feel insecure about it. And do they spend time and money and resources trying to manipulate my behavior? Absolutely. Day in and day out. And we're adults, and we, we are not above these campaigns to somehow make us feel insecure about who we are. We have insecurities. I have insecurities. When I was a little kid, I went to bed till I was in the sixth grade. My brothers and sisters called me Peapot. Not once, not twice, thousands of times. Fortunately, I stopped wetting the bed. Imagine if you can't change your skin color. Imagine if you can't change the shape of your nose. Oh wait, you can change the shape of your nose now. And how many thousands of people went to a surgical center today to have the shape of their nose changed? Let's let the little kids that are going to come into our schools tomorrow, let's let them have their nose, their skin color, their freckles, their imperfections, and let's just take them as they are and try and make them a little bit better human beings than when they arrived. That's our job. Somehow advance these kiddos. Help them understand the world. Help them see the glory, the wonder, the special cool things out there. And let's don't make them feel insecure that they don't have the right shoes or they don't have the right shirt. That's the challenge we have because someone right now is intentionally trying to shape their perception of themselves. And it works. Bosley and Rogaine would not do this if it didn't work. It works. We have an election that's going to happen 
And they are going to spend over a billion dollars easily attempting to shape how people view and think about things and places. And I just want us to be aware that sometimes there's a gorilla. And sometimes we're too busy counting the balls that we didn't see the other stuff. That is courageous, though, and I don't know if we're always up to the challenge. Because we get so focused on seeing things a certain way that we don't even see things as they are. And it causes family feuds over cars when someone dies. It causes family feuds over things that really we forget where it started. And then our kids go to Thanksgiving and Christmas and they're hanging out and they say, why doesn't Grandpa talk to his brother anymore? The kids come in, they don't understand that rule at all. Something happened 30 years ago, and they have had a riff ever since. They spoke to each other, see each other 30 years. And the kids go, why? I kind of like him. He looks kind of funny. He's got cool shoes on. Can I talk to him? And Grandpa said, you don't go talk to him. We ain't talked in years. And I know what happens to everybody. And it's scary. So what can we do? There's all kinds of things we can do. We can first recognize that it's all about geography. It's all about your time and where you live that influences you. Be aware of that. Where you live, where you reside, where you grew up, determine the language you learned, the values you inherited, and determine what you thought was funny and cool. It's okay. It's not right, it's not wrong, it's just the way it is. Accept that, understand that, embrace that. Learn about it. Because everybody has a story, regardless of wherever they are on the earth. And how we dress from the 1300s to the 21, 2010s just depended on the time and history. Go back and look at your... Why don't you go back and put on the same thing you wore to senior pictures? You say, oh my gosh, what was I thinking then? Times change and so do we. And that's okay. And so much of this, as I mentioned, since we do not fill the void, there is a whole industry out there that is designed to fulfill the void, and it scares me. So let's take a look at a few video clips here of people, it's events that are trying to fill our times, and think of the power that we are giving up when sometimes we don't step in and somehow shape the message. <laughs>
our perception of beauty is distorted. We can't compare to that because it's not even real. But we were taught that we have to compare to something real. It makes us feel inferior. It makes us feel no good. And what do we do? Do we try and fill that void with someone or someone else's product? Young kids don't pay for those ads. Young kids don't make them. We do. We do. We're adults. It's the same old story for men. Very famous advertising campaign. It's been around for a long time. The first clip I have is from the 1970s. And I'm going to give you a chance to, to win up some, some nuts over here. And maybe a <laughs> some off me. If you can understand this little, this little whistle. Old Spice. Uh -huh. 1970s, take a look. Manipulating young boys. <coughs> Sailing with attractive woman. Dorky kid with glasses, day late, dollar short all the time. Oh, wow, I wish I could be him. You're a nerdy kid. Try that. Make no mistake, when I talk about intentionality, when that cool guy threw that bottle of Old Spice to that nerdy kid, you've seen him bobble it, right? What happens if the kid would have caught it just like that? Do you think that they would have put that on the ad? No. And if we aren't sitting in a room with young people, when they see these images about how they are intentionally trying to shape what we're teaching Jeff Roy about a football and that it's a green football, if we aren't there to filter that, they do not have our kids' interests in mind. And we have to understand that if we want to change how our young people learn to view things, others, and themselves. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, I am an educator, and I'm responsible for shaping behavior. It's all I do. 1890s. Next little spice commercial. I used to think it didn't matter what the owner I chose. <clears throat> Dumb. This test shows that Old Spice is the right choice. Old Spice performs in real-man situations like basketball, recon, and friendship. Try Old Spice, and if you still don't think it's awesome, call 1-800-PROVE-IT, and they'll buy you a stick of something that smells like wildflowers and shame. <laughs> Take the Old Spice challenge. I did. Don't have any feminine smells at all. Don't smell like a woman. Be a man. I, I can't tell you how many times my grandmother gave me Old Spice. For yes. <laughs> It does smell good, but does our, does our perception of good, does it get associated with that? Heck yes. It's brilliant. And now here's the modern day version of the Old Spice commercial that you've probably seen. Hello there. Look at your man. Now back to me. Now back to your man. Now back to me. Sadly, he isn't me. But if you stop using lady scented body wash and switch to Old Spice, he could smell like he's me. Look down. Back up. Where are you? You're on a boat with the man your man could smell with. What's in your head? Ask me. I am. It's an oyster with two tickets to that thing you love. Look again. The tickets are now diamond. Anything is possible when your man smells like Old Spice and not a lady. I'm on a horse. Good stuff. <laughs> it works, right? And we're not immune to that. So over time, we develop paradigms of what's normal. A paradigm is a rigid belief about his person, place, or thing that shapes our actions. And what companies want to happen, and what we try and make happen in education, is we also are trying to shape paradigms, shape beliefs about certain things, through the interactions we have, through the transactions and the manipulations that we give students in schools. And normal is relative. Growing up in my household on Cherokee Lane, double white trailer, eight of us in, the, in this place, my mom and dad introduced me to macaroni and cheese with applesauce. And that is the only way I knew to eat macaroni and cheese was mixed with applesauce. That became my normal. And I didn't know that my normal caused people to do that until I was in college. And I ate that and my roommates looked at me like, what the heck are you doing, Everhart? I realized at that moment that normal is different. It depends on the geography, where you live, and time. And we have to take that time to understand that everybody's normal is different. It's not right, it's not wrong, it's not good, it's not bad. But help me understand your normal. 
Because at the end of the day, I want people to be more productive, capable, happy human beings. And it takes a little time. So how do you mix the applesauce with the macaroni? <laughs> just take the apple, macaroni and cheese and just put apple slice right, right, right on and you mix it up. So cute. I did the same presentation for my staff. I got an email from one of my science teachers a couple weeks later and he said, Chris, I tried it and it's pretty good. <laughs> and many of you won't even try it. You will not even try it because you have such rigid beliefs already about how you eat applesauce. You won't even try it. I want to try it. I'm curious. It's really good. <laughs> Try it. In China, years and years ago, they taught young girls that this was considered beautiful. They would teach them to bind their feet. And they did this for years and years. And women did this their whole life because that is what was considered attractive. And when you think of that, you think, oh my gosh, that's weird, that's appalling. But folks, that was their normal. We have 1,600 students in our district, and their normal is different all over the place. Even if they're from the same house, because if your gender is different, and you grew up in a different room, and you were at a different age, your experience in life was different. And to be effective as educators, we have to understand that, because that is really the only thing we control in our classrooms, is how we interact with those kiddos. That was normal then. Normal depends on, once again, where you live. This is considered attractive in certain cultures where young boys, instead of getting subwoofers and nice rims, they get a lip palette and the girls think, oh, he's attractive. He's got a big lip palette. Just like a lot of young girls were taken to have their ears pierced in our culture. They didn't ask for that. It's our ways to start sending signals about what's pretty. Don't judge them without us taking a look at maybe what we do too. It's not right, it's not wrong, it's not good, it's not bad, it's just the way it is. And if we want to see the gorilla in the room, we got to have the courage to look at our own gorillas. That's their normals. So it becomes difficult to know what's real all the time. And what I want to finish with today is what I'm hoping you folks can walk out of here is a simple, three simple things about what I'm asking us to consider, what I ask my staff and I'm asking students to consider, is we need leadership. And leaders, leadership doesn't come in November every three or four years. Leadership happens every day. It happens in micro steps. It happens in transactions with the gift we call the present. What will you do the next time? That's what I want our students to do, and that's what I'm asking us to do. If we can't take courageous steps in our lives, then how can we ask young children to do that in theirs? So the first thing I'm going to ask you to do is be aware. We have to have the courage simply to recognize that this stuff happens, that students are marginalized, that people are marginalized, that we're not all the same, that we're different, that it's not always, always right or wrong. It's about taking time to understand the differences that make us this world experience beautiful and value that. And sometimes what we'll find out is that we're all programmed over time and that is normal. You hear a lot about a thing called implicit bias now. And I'm going to give you a really simple example of what implicit bias is. And we're all implicit, we have implicit biases. It's not right, it's not wrong, it's your bias because you're a human. And here's an example. So I have, on the next two slides, I have letters. And on the next slide, you're going to see five rows of letters. And what I want you to do is I want you to tell me the color of the letters on that row. So, for example, this would be like white, right? That's white, right? It's five rows of letters. Tell me the color of the letters are written in, okay? And do this as quickly as you can aloud. Ready? Go. Red. Red. Uh, no problem, right? You can do that. Again, but I want you to go faster. Same thing. Here you go. <laughs> so what's what's what changed? <laughs> so information over time that you learn about colors and words conflicted. 
And this is what implicit bias is. Those things that you acquire over time that you don't even realize it, that shape your interactions with other people. Examples. So if I was to say a particular occupation, what gender pops in your head? Secretary. Female. Nurse. Female. Senator. Male. President. Male. Plumber. Male. Elementary teacher. Female. Social studies high school teacher. I, it's, it's not wrong, it's not good, it's not bad, it's the way it is. And whether we realize or not, our interactions with people are oftentimes shaped by our experiences that we've had from zero to today. That's why Jeff Roy's brain pays attention to everything. He's going to learn biases. And a bias is not always good or bad. Chevy wants you to have a bias too. So does Dodge. So does a Toyota. They want you to have a bias as well. Some of you have loyalty to things that you don't even understand. Like you won't even try macaroni and cheese and applesauce. <laughs> because you have a loyalty to macaroni and cheese and ketchup for some reason. Or something, like, something weird like that. <laughs> so the first thing I ask you to do is be aware. Be aware that at the end of the day, our normal can be different. There's a man who owned a hardware store out in eastern Oregon, a small little town. And oftentimes, when he was, uh, uh, had a store open on the weekend, people would bring in puppies for him to sell because, you know, they'd bring him in off the farm and they'd say, hey, Bill, can you sell these puppies? And Bill had gotten some puppies one weekend and he's putting up a sign outside of his store that says puppies for sale. And it works. Within two minutes, this little boy comes up to him and says, Mr. Mr., how much are you going to sell those their puppies for? And the man says, oh, anywhere from $30 to $50. The little boy reaches down in his pocket and he pulls out all of his worldly possessions and he counts them up in the palm of his hand. He said, I have $2.37. Can I at least look at them puppies? And the man says, sure, come on in. As they walk into the store, the puppy, uh, the man whistles to the back of the store and says, lady, come. And out of the back of the store comes the mama dog followed by five teeny tiny balls of fur. And the little boy is smiling. He notices that one of the puppies is kind of lagging behind. And he pays attention to that puppy. And when they're around him and the store owner, he says to the man, he says, Sir, what's the deal with that puppy, the one that's limping a little bit? And the man says, Oh, that puppy is, uh, the, took him to the vet. He has a cripple, he has a lame uh, leg, and it doesn't work so good. He'll never, you know, he kind of got a problem. And the little boy smiled. And he said, I tell you what, sir, can I have that dog? Can I buy him today? And the store owner was kind of shocked. He says, I'll tell you what, little guy, you want that puppy? You can have him for nothing. He's yours. Take it. Instead of being excited by that, the little boy said, I don't want that puppy for nothing. He's just as good as all those other puppies. I'll give you $2.37 today and 50 cents a week until I have him paid for. But he's just as good as all those other puppies. And the man was kind of shocked. He said, but little guy, that puppy's never going to run or jump or play with you like the other puppies. Are you sure? And with that, the little boy stepped back, pulled up his pant leg, exposing his badly crippled leg, supported by a heavy metal brace, and said, see, I don't run so good either, and I know the puppy's going to need someone who understands. Mm -hmm. Who doesn't need a little compassion and empathy thrown their way once in a while? We're all went the long through life sometimes, folks. Don't think your superintendent's got it made. Nobody's got it made. We all got a story. We're all wounded. We're all nicked a little bit. And we have to be aware of that because it might just help us in our next transaction with the fellow human being. And then we have to be courageous. It's not easy to do these things. It's not easy to go into the South in the 1950s to register black voters like these three gentlemen did. They were taken, they were murdered, and they were buried in the ground. The story about these three men, Mississippi Ernie. Was it courageous to do that? Yes. I'm not asking you to do that. That's really courageous. I'm not asking you to do that. But that is an example of being courageous. All four of these men were assassinated in the 1960s because they were trying to extend rights to people that were marginalized. All, th all four of them assassinated. I'm not asking you to lead a civil rights movement. I'm not asking you to go to India and try and let the untouchables have rights and privileges like Gandhi did. He too was assassinated. Very courageous man. 
I'm not asking you to sit on the front of the bus. I'm not asking you to sit at the Woolworth counter. But I am asking you to consider this. This simple rule that I think can impact our communities and our culture. It's the just kidding rule. <clears throat> Here it is. If you have to say, don't take me serious. I didn't mean that. I was just kidding. If you have to say that after you said something, you probably shouldn't have said it in the first place. And if we don't start confronting the language we use with one another, I assure you, things will continue to disintegrate between humans. Because words are the first form of violence. I have never had students in my office where it did not start with words. Words hurt. Sticks and stones may break our bones, but words will never hurt. One of the biggest lies I've heard in my entire life. I would have rather had my brother punch me in the arm than call me Peapod. And we have to have the courage to confront the language we're using with each other. It is the civil rights movement of the 21st century. Because words matter. Because they shape our views towards one another. And it's where hate builds and boils until we can do things to one another. Adolf Hitler and his regime in 1930s, they didn't use anything but words to shape the people's views of certain communities of people to do what they did. It was words and pictures and images again and again and again. And once you think and believe things about a certain group or person or place or thing, you will then behave in a way that's predictable. <coughs> we too can do that. We have the power to shape that. And I'm asking us to stand courageously and confront sarcasm and belittling comments in our presence. And that's courageous because I know what happens. And you'll be alone when you do it. But if we can't ask kids to do it, excuse me, we can't ask kids to do it if we're not willing to do it ourselves. Seems overly simple, but my hunch is you're going to see in the next 24 hours where you will see places where we can take a stand. Be aware, be courageous. Hey, you're taking this shit, right? And do things like this. That's so gay. It's a really good say that something is gay when you mean that something is dumb or stupid. It's insulting. It's like if I thought this pepper shaker was stupid and I said, man, this pepper shaker is so 16-year-old boy with a cheesy mustache. Just saying. <laughs> when you say that so gay, do you realize what you say? Knock it off. It's not acceptable to call me a hater. It's not acceptable to call me a speck. To call me a chick. To call me a fag. It's not acceptable to call me a fag. And it's not acceptable to call me a retard or call yourself or your friends retarded when they do something foolish. The R word is the same as every minority slur. Treat it that way and don't use it. So words, I'm asking for your help. We have to take a stand there because it's a start of aggressive behavior towards other humans. And the last thing I want you to do is just encourage others. People need to be inspired. And sometimes it's just a kind word and it's a kind gesture. You know, the lion in The Wizard of Oz, the lion knew exactly what to do, right? And he drove or drove, walked all this way to get to the wizard. And all the wizard did was give him courage. And that's sometimes all we need to give other people is courage because they already know. But folks, we are afraid. 90-90 rule. 90% of the time, 90% of us know exactly what we need to do, but we're afraid to do it. You're going to have a chance in the next day to stand up and model courage. It's not always easy. And the more people who do that, those are micro steps that can make macro moves. And I'm asking us to do that because we're the adults in the room.
be aware, be courageous, and encourage others. One of the best fictional character, characters I can ever think of of encouraging people is, do you know who that is? Forrest. Forrest Gump. <laughs> relentlessly positive, relentlessly encouraging, supportive to Jenny, to Lieutenant Dan, to Bubba. Relentlessly positive. And he, you don't have to have money. You don't have to be rich. You don't have to have status to do the things I'm asking you to do. You have to have purpose and the desire to do it. I'll leave you with a story. There's a man walking along the beach one morning as the sun was coming up. It was a beautiful, beautiful day. And as the sun came up, and he was walking along. He had to be careful where he stepped because as the tide washed out, it left behind lots of starfish. So he didn't want to step on the starfish, but it was beautiful nevertheless. And as he's walking, he looks down ahead of him and he sees what appears to be a young lady out running about on the morning, in the morning sun playing on the beach as he is. And he thinks that's beautiful. It's nice to see someone enjoying the morning as I am. But when he gets closer, he realizes that this girl is not running and having fun. Instead, she's scattering running around the beach, picking up the starfish that are scattered everywhere, lifting them up and flinging them out into the ocean. And when he finally reaches this young girl, he says, young lady, what is it that you're doing? And she says, mister, mister, can't you see? If I don't pick up these starfish and I don't throw them out in the water, the sun will come up, they'll dry out, and they'll die. And with the years and wisdom the man had, he lifted his arm and went like this along the beach and said, look, there's miles and miles of beach and thousands of starfish. How could you possibly make a difference? And with that, she simply stepped back, bent down, picked up another starfish, and flung it out in the water and said, I've made a difference to that one. It's what I want our students to do. That's what I want my staff to do, to build each other's views of themselves and other people in a way that is more favorable for themselves and encourage them to learn love and be a better person. And it all starts with the gift of the present, that next transaction. So I'm going to leave you with that last thing that says, if when you woke up tomorrow you thought, wow, I am like the most important person on the planet Earth in my community in Brookings. Everybody seems to pay attention to what I think and do. I have more power than I ever thought I had before. And you think to myself, do you think to yourself, what am I going to do differently today? And you think, well, I should probably do this and this. And my thought to you is, why don't we do that now? Why don't we do those things now? So I wish you the best. Thank you for letting me share a message with you. And I appreciate your time and attention. Thank you. questions or what's there anything? Anybody has a question? Yes. Well, first of all, I want to say that I was kidding about the 049 engines uh, being a thousand dollars. You can buy them for about 20 bucks. Oh, okay. Well, this and, one's worth 10,000. And 10, a new thousand. propeller, a new propeller if you want yeah. to. <laughs> Secondly, I noticed you're wearing a shirt that's inside, whereas me, the old fogey, I'm still buying one if you tuck in. Yeah. And thirdly, I used to work in the advertising business. I've been spent four years doing that. And um, 15 of it I was involved in politics on yeah. both sides, and the tactics were all pretty much the same, and it was a struggle and it was a fight, and we fought dirty sure. regardless. And fourthly, I'd like to say I really enjoyed this present. Good. <laughs> well, I didn't like my shirt. Santa brought it. <laughs> The shirt, I don't know. You know, get, tell you. Oh, is it? I don't. I don't know. No. True. True thing about the shirts. So when I was going, my mother used to say this to me all the time. Tuck in your shirt. You look like a slob. <laughs> tuck in. So for years, I am dead serious. I would. I had my young kids, and I would tuck in my shirt all the time because when I took it out, I felt undressed. So literally, I did not untuck my shirt at times until just a few years ago. So there's a big reveal. Oh, I'm coming out. I can do it. I'm okay. I'm still a man. <laughs> Barely. Actually, it's rather current style. I know. It depends on your time. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. I just want to share a super quick oh, I um, one. and a uh, friend of mine that's a teacher had a 
had a student that came from a, a you know, a troubled home life and everything. And there were some achievement tests that they had to do. And this girl scored very well. And she didn't do that well in class. And the teacher took her aside, and you know, it's not necessarily politically correct to tell a kid how they score versus, but she just said, you know, you score one of the highest scores in this classroom. You are smart. And from that point on, that child's total behavior, personality, it was just life changing. Yeah. And what you're saying, the little bit, the little starfish, the little acts of kindness, um, understanding, we never know how, little, how big those little acts are going to become. People pay attention to us, whether we like it or not. Yeah. Darn it. <laughs> yeah. 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 There, were, there was a study that came out last week that over the last, I forget how many years, the weight and ratio of body dimensions of Victoria's Secret models has gotten smaller and smaller, while the weight and body dimensions ratio weight of the average American woman has gotten bigger. And yeah, you know, so the message being sent is worse yeah. every day. Thought that was bad. Yeah. Wow. Story. Well, they certainly want to, don't want to tell you you're okay the way you are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you have a good presentation discussing the internet and social media? And well, yeah. Well, you, yes, I can. I, it's, it's, it, it's if crazy. we were to talk for longer, I would share with you. Yeah, the power of that is profound. And my message to that is kids don't own it, it's adults. Adults own the tech industry, adults own phones, adults pay the cable bill. And if we don't want kids on, adults need to be courageous because it's not a kid thing, it's an adult thing. It's adults victimizing children. It's manipulating their behavior to somehow have financial gain because the young kids in our market are consumers and they control a lot of advertising now because they are trying to change their minds about things. But you want to fight that battle? I'm on your team. But that's a tough battle. I've got a marketing idea. <laughs> I too was in advertising for 35 years with major clients. And I think this is the introduction to a new series on YouTube called Chris Talk. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I would really like, I know there's probably pieces in here that are copyrighted that cannot be used in a presentation like that. But if those, if those are there and were removed, I would love to see this on YouTube. You want to change tomorrow? Tomorrow. This is the best piece of data that I've seen in a long time. I've seen a lot of those comparisons like the Dove situation and, and the cutting and all. This is excellent. And the other market that needs to see it are the parents of this school district in some way to get to them. Sure, I'll show up. Yeah. Thank you. We have to figure out how to make that happen because this room needs to be filled with 1,600, 3,200 parents and guardians from Perkins High School and grade school and middle school and preschool. But get those I don't know how to do that, Chris. Well, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're all here. I'm, I'm one, hopefully you feel empowered with, with, with today and tomorrow and the next day. Within, if I can help in any way. Within a week, you'll be able to watch this oh, on currycountyvoices.com website and YouTube. You know how hard it is to watch yourself, though? Right? <laughs> you know, like to listen to your own voice. Oh, God. Just turn the video down. Listen. Yeah. The words. Probably just here for this year, is that right? I'm an interim superintendent. Yes. Which is like a one year. Yeah. They should have somebody. Yeah. So do you, I mean, are there, how would we know if you were giving other lectures, presentations? Um, I mean, do you have plans to do that? Or? Yeah, I mean, I would. 
I don't have anything else to do. Right? No, I'd love to. This is my passion. This is this is the most important work we do. It's it is very important to me that we understand this particular. I taught psychology for many years, and this is the first chapter of perception. Understanding how we manipulate how people view themselves, other people, and things if you want to change stuff. And we're not people they have it figured out. Other companies have it figured out. And you're going to see more advertising on TV in the political world in the next 10 months, folks, than you, we're going to know what to do. And we don't not so much in Oregon, but some. We're kind of lucky. Yeah. We're not one of those. Yeah, so yeah. Colorado. That's where I'm from. Colorado. I've been there from Colorado. I'd be happy to speak with any time that you would arrange that.